Good morning, everyone. Um, it's wonderful to see so many people uh, interested in the topic, and we are very happy that you have all registered and that you are with us this morning um, for this very, um, I hope, interesting and I'm sure interesting and important webinar. Um, European Agenda for Access to Music Education. On behalf of the European Music Council, I welcome everyone to this. Almost three years ago, in February 2018, the European Agenda for Music was officially launched in Brussels. And some of you might have been there or were there. And although it's only three years, it actually already seems quite a long time. Um, some of you have also been actively involved in shaping the very first version of the European Agenda for Music. And so you might know that from the very beginning of this document, the European Agenda for Music, or shortly EAM, was always envisaged as a living document because society changes. And for this, of course, always the framework in which music happens changes. But of course, never had we thought that such an incisive event as COVID-19 would bring about such drastic changes for the music sector so quickly. So even more important to keep the European agenda for music alive and changing. Nevertheless, the key idea of the European agenda for music remains valid. And the aim is to converge the many voices of the European music sector in order to establish an ongoing dialogue between policymakers and the music sector stakeholders. And um, for those who are familiar with the European agenda, uh, this will be nothing new, but um, the basis of the EIM is the threefold nature of music, because music is an art form and music has an intrinsic value with an art form. Music can serve as a tool for social change and music can be a product that contributes to the economy. Today, this seminar will focus on the first two elements, basically. Um, so it will look at access to music education in the context of the European Agenda for Music. And we are very, very grateful that our very important and prominent music education members, such as the AEC, the EMU and the EAS, and they will introduce themselves uh, in a moment more in detail, have come together to work on this webinar and to bring this webinar forward. So we are only putting the framework and we are very, very grateful that uh, these three important music education organizations networks um, have set up the content. And we are also very happy that we can welcome um, Dominic Ruiz de Vesa, um, a very special greeting and welcome to you, Mr. Dominic um, Ruiz de Vesa, as a member of the European Parliament. He will also um, address you a little bit later. Um, and it's really great to also have political representation here to listen and to get involved in the exchange that we will have in the coming 90 minutes uh, on the importance of music education in Europe. So uh, I wish you all a wonderful, fruitful exchange, and I look very much forward to the outcome of this webinars, the future steps and the collaborations of the session today. And now I hand over to Eirik Birkeland, who as president of the AEC and member of the board of the EMC represents this very good collaboration and liaison between EMC and its members very well. So welcome. Many thanks, Simone, and welcome to you all. I'm glad to see that so many people have found opportunity to take part today. The European Music Council is an umbrella organization which brings an impressive number of European music organizations together. And the European Agenda for Music is an important document for us all. However, it is written on a general level and needs to be made operational. The three organizations, EAS, EMU, and AEC, are collaborating on this and want to ask for your input for further development of the agenda and for the concrete actions to be taken. The agenda has three core objectives, education and access to music, diversity and shaping society. I expect that we all agree that access to music and music education comes first. 
I also expect that while the European agenda addresses music education in general on different levels and in formal and informal settings, we can agree that the largest and most important arena of them all is the primary school. And although we know that there is often a deep gap between the beautiful rhetorics about music and arts on overarching levels and the neglected subjects in everyday life, we should always keep in mind that the primary school might be the only place where we can really reach out to all members of society. Children who at this age have the chance to experience the encounter with music, art and creative activity as something positive will never forget this in life. To be able to obtain significant results, we need to connect our agenda to the major political agendas on the European level. I will highlight two of them. Firstly, from STEM to STEAM, the new six-year plan period for the EU's multinational framework starts this year. And the key topics for education has been announced as not only science, technology, engineering and mathematics summed up in the well-established acronym STEM, but will also include the arts. STEM will acquire an A in the middle and become STEAM. Implementing the A for the arts should be a perfect incentive for securing access to music and arts education for all children. Secondly, and hopefully as part of the STEAM incorporation, the EU Commission will re-implement the eight key competencies for lifelong learning. And the key competence number eight is now renamed as cultural awareness and expression competence. We will strongly urge the EU to monitor and follow closely the implementation of the key competencies on national level. This kind of transparency is necessary to put pressure on leaders on all levels for strengthening their ambitions for music and arts education and for closing the gap between rhetorics and reality. Dear friends, I hope we will have a constructive exchange of opinions today and will encourage you all to contribute in the breakout groups. I now have the pleasure of handing over to project and event manager of the AEC, Sara Rimetera. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. I will now share my screen for a brief presentation of the AEC. Hello, everyone. I'm Sara Primitera. I am a long-standing staff member of the Executive Office of the AC, the European Association of Conservatoires. Founded in 1953, the AC is the leading voice of higher music education in Europe. With higher music education, we mean professional music training at tertiary level, which is basically university level. We are a network of around 300 higher education institutions in 57 countries. In our vision, professional arts education is a quest for excellence in three main areas, artistic practice, learning and teaching, and research and innovation. Our mission is the advancement of the performing arts education with a primary focus on music. And we do that based on four main pillars enhancing quality, fostering the value of music education and music in society, promoting participation and diversity, and promoting partnerships and interaction at national and international level. We function mainly as a think tank uh, with working groups and projects devoted to specific themes. We work as a hub for our sector uh, through mainly our events, our website, and other specific online tools. And finally, we advocate for our sector at national and international level through meetings, presentations, policy papers, and statements. We work in connection with a number of partners, which are mainly other networks in the field of culture, music, and education. And here on the screen, you can see a list of them, including the networks involved in this joint event. 
We have our main meeting for our members, which is the annual Congress and General Assembly taking place in November. Uh, one of the most important discussions and information sessions uh, uh, for our sector take place. And then we have a number of thematic platforms which run throughout the years and they address specific constituencies uh, within our member institutions. And you can see here on the screen uh, the various uh, subjects. And then our project-based activities. We normally run one large multi-annual project which is meant to support and give a framework to the main activities of our network. The current one is called AC, Strengthening Music in Society, and is financed by Creative Europe. Uh, it is composed by these seven main strengths, music in society, diversity, entrepreneurship, internationalization, learning and teaching, digitization and early childhood education, and this is in cooperation with MU and AAS, and students' involvement. And finally, the, involved is in, the EC is involved as a project partner in a number of other projects run by our members institution, which are mainly founded by Erasmus Plus and Creative Europe. And in those projects, the EC has a main role in communication, dissemination and evaluation. That's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Thomas de Baats. I'm president of uh, the European Association for Music in Schools, and I will also share my screen in order to give you a short introduction to the EAS. The EAS is a European network for music education. That's obvious, I think, uh, for music education in and around schools, founded in September 1990 in Lübeck, Germany. So it means that we recently could celebrate our 30th anniversary. And we were quite happy to do so. Um, what do we do? Well, we try to interconnect all those involved in music education, teachers, teachers, educators. We have a lot of teacher educators in our net network and uh, in the membership, researchers, students, musicians, policymakers to share knowledge and experience and practice in research and to advocate for high quality music education that is accessible to all young people. What you see here on the slide is um, our new mission statement uh, that is in process and will be um, presented to our general meeting in March. So we focus on music education in and around schools and we are a membership organization uh, connecting um, individual members, the groups that I just mentioned, but also institutional members. And in the category of institutional members, um, we, um, we have national associations for music education in schools, also universities, conservators, music teacher, training institutes, also other institutes. And of course, we have some honorary members. What is central in our work? Uh, well, uh, since the very beginning, we have an annual conference. And this is really the focus point in every year that we operate. To give you a short impression, we normally reach out to around 300 uh, participants visiting um, our conference. We are a Europe, European partner of the ISME, the International Society for Music Education, and every two years our uh, conference is recognized as the European Regional uh, Conference of ISME. What happens at the conference? Um, well, it, it, this is also quite obvious. We have practical uh, workshops, we have research papers, projects. You see the list uh, there. Um, maybe typical for us is that we always work um, with a peer reviewed uh, system of accepting uh, contributions to our conferences. The next conference will take in Freiburg this year, in March, Freiburg in Breisgau in Germany. Well, I have to say it will take place, but of course, fully online, given the current circumstances. Um, some typical things for EAS is that we have a network of national coordinators. Most European countries are formally represented by a national coordinator. The national coordinator is the person that connects the national with the European level, so reports uh, about EAS in the national networks and vice versa. It's a liaison that we have. This is a photo from 2015. I should have found a, a more recent photo, but this is just uh, an impression of uh, this group. We have a book series connected mainly to the conferences. Uh, we are now uh, preparing volume 10. Uh, all details can also be found on our web website. 
the the book series is at the moment uh, published with Helbling. Um, since some years, we also have some uh, special working groups. We call them the special focus groups. At the moment, we have a uh, well. These groups are members. Um, um, well, that are interested in one specific focus and meet up at conferences, but also outside our conferences. One group focuses on practitioner research, one group on uh, digital technologies, and one group on singing. And this is a very dynamic system, so it can always happen that a new group appears or that the group disappears and so on. Um, for more information about the EAS, you can always visit our website, and I can also refer to the book that we have published uh, on the occasion of our 25th anniversary, focusing on international cooperation in music education, which includes chapters on EAS, on the history of EAS, on EAS projects, but also on the partnership that we are presenting uh, today. There are some chapters uh, focusing on that. Thank you for your attention, and I think I hand over to my colleague Philippe from EMU. Yeah, thank you, Thomas, and hello, everybody. And many thanks to the EMC for organizing this webinar. So I'm Philippe Dallarin, president of the European Music School Union. For its part, the European Music School Union, EMU, has existed since 1973. The EMU is an umbrella organization that brings together 26 national associations of music and art schools, mainly music schools, representing in Europe more than 6,000 schools, 150,000 professionals and 4 million students. Our office is located in Berlin and according to our statutes, our objectives are to promote music education and music practice, to cooperate by exchanging information on all matters concerning music education, to promote exchanges of teachers and students between European music schools, to raise the interest of the competent European and national authorities in matters concerning music education, to help in the creation and development of national associations of music school where they do not yet exist, and last but not least, to collaborate with international and especially European partners in the field of culture and music education. In addition to the European Forum of Music School that we organize every year, the next one, we hope, will take place in Bordeaux in May. Our actions range from the organization of capacity building seminars for directors and teachers to the patronage of European Youth Music Festivals. By the way, the next festival will take place in 2022 in Luxembourg. As it is the case today with this webinar, the collaboration with our partners is becoming more and more important to us, whether it is with the EMC, IMC, International Music Council, AEC, EAS, the group Music Quality Enhancement, and the university research as well. Like all of you, I'm sure we are aware of the complexity of the world we live in, the speed at which technical and societal changes are taking place, and the seriousness of the challenges the European society has to face, as we can see every day. In this context, we believe, on the one hand, that music education must evolve to adapt to the modern society, especially to develop new pedagogical tools and address new audiences. And on the other hand, that music education and culture is a vital key to help our society become more democratic, fair, and inclusive. This is why we strongly believe that uh, it is through joint reflection and action like today that we will be able to have weight, credibility and influence and that we will be able to move things forward, especially in the frame of the European agenda for music. Thank you. And I think I have to give the word now to Stefan from the AEC. Okay, thanks to Sarah, to Philip. Um, so I, I, my task is to talk a little bit about our consortium scheme. And I would first ask what are the most important features that these three associations share with each other and what do they have in common? First of all, all three are members of the European Music Council 
and all three are active across borders with a very strong focus on Europe. But I think the most crucial might be that these all three associations together covers a different, uh, the, the whole, let's say, a spectrum of institutionalized music education on a European level with a clear task sharing among the three. Informal contacts between the three associations have existed for a long time. The collaboration was formalized for the first time under the Full Score program, which was an AEC led project lasting from 2014 to 2017, and which was funded by the European Commission under its Creative Europe program. Full Score was not a program that specifically dealt with music education, but uh, with a challenge that the music sector as a whole, in, in all its sub areas, had to face music performance, music production music marketing, festivals, children choirs, operas, rock music, et cetera, et cetera. And within the framework of full score, the operational task, so to say, to uh, deal with education was delegated to SCHEME, to our three associations. And SCHEME stands for Steering Committee for the Harmonization of European Music Education. SCHEME was basically uh, six, person working group with two representatives, each from EMO, EAS, and AEC. And I let's we just go very quickly through the uh, seven bullet points from the project description. The point one was strengthening the liaison with the European Music Council. And indeed, at the same time when full score got started, AMC decided to work out the European agenda for music, which my colleague uh, Till will say more about in a moment. And this task to further working out the music education part of the European agenda was delegated to us, so to say. Point two and three is, um, yes, uh, consulting the three partner organizations, I think, and sharing dissemination. I think no further comment is needed on this. Point four and five are about how, how to reach this goal is a bit operational. And of course, this served the purpose of intensifying mutual acquaintance and understanding for one another. The point six is uh, a very hands-on outcome, writing a joint article describing the cooperation. And this has been published um, with the EAS anthology. Uh, Thomas was talking about it earlier with uh, the Austrian publishing house Helpling. You can find this on our websites. Point seven is, so to say, the following up of the work to be done. So, and I think um, I, I can say that we have proven to be a very powerful consortium at this point because uh, we have worked out together in a very structured and targeted way, I would say. And that's a real uh, asset, thanks for the cooperation with EAS and AMO. When the project ended in 2017 and we had uh, delivered on time what we had been asked for, based on our positive experience in working together, we decided to continue the collaboration even if there was no more funding extra, and even if there was no longer such a specific task as the development of a European agenda. <clears throat> but we did run out of topics that are worth discussing and pursuing the joint action. Rather, the contrary is due. So we continue to meet regularly. Representatives from EAS, EMO, and AEC are represented at the board of the Quality Assurance Agency Music. We have decided together to work on a follow-up to the European Agenda for Music, and we have a shared political agenda to advocate for the sake of music education. I do not want to go into this further detail now, because you'll learn more about this in the course of this webinar. And now I leave the floor to my colleague, Till. Yeah, thank you, Stefan. I will also start sharing my screen just a moment. So, um, what I would like to talk about real quick is um, about the implementation of the agenda. My name is Tils Gerupa. I am the Secretary General of the EMU. However, I also used to work for the, um, for the EMC, the European Music Council, as, as program manager some years ago. And uh, in that role, I was involved in the early stages of the agenda. So I took part in a lot of discussions at the beginning about the vision of what we want to achieve. and. Um, was involved in, um, in the organization of some of the very, very early um, stages. Um, what we wanted to do in this seminar today was, of course, to um, introduce a little bit the work of our network, which we, of our respective networks, which was done. 
Um, Stefan has spoken a little bit about scheme, um, which was also one of the aims of the seminar today. And the third aim was to speak a little bit about um, how the agenda connects to our work, to the work of scheme. And this is something that I wanted to contribute. Um, this is why I called my presentation, what we talk about when we talk about implementing the agenda. Now, um, implementing the agenda is not necessarily a term that we use a lot within scheme, but um, for for the sake of taking the perspective of EMC, I wanted to uh, to use it in my title. Um, implementing the agenda is uh, something I, I will not say that it's confusing, but uh, my impression was that it has certainly many different um, interpretations, or it allows for many different interpretations. And I just wanted to um, quickly share some thoughts on um, how. We use it basically. Now, um, Stefan has spoken a lot about our respective networks and he has spoken a lot about what we have in common. But of course, um, you will have observed that there are also some uh, some differences or let's say complementarities as we call it because differences has some notion of competition and I think complementarities cover this a lot more because our network cover the whole range for, of music education from kindergarten to higher music education. However, we address um, different target groups, or at least our main target groups are a bit different. Um, they certainly also have a different uh, age, typically. Um, the music education is typically done in a little bit different settings um, from group lessons, certainly in, in primary school, to more one-on-one -on -one lessons. Um, some institution includes informal uh, um, educational settings, band practice, orchestra practice, these kind of things. Curricula and especially curricula design is certainly something um, that is different in our institution, especially when speaking about where the curricula are defined, whether it's something that institutions make up for themselves, whether it's done on a local or regional level, on a national level, or maybe even on a European level. And they are certainly uh, in the field of higher music education, lots of efforts being done to harmonize um, uh, 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 contents and study programs on a European level. Membership structure, again, it's quite different um, from having individuals as members to having individual institutions as members to having, in the case of the EMU, national associations um, as members. And finally, of course, our method of working means and resources also differ quite a lot. Now, if we if we take all these these um, complementarities into account, you might think that it leads to um, uh, different political interests, to different goals, and maybe even to conflicting goals. And I think this is um, where the agenda comes into play. Um, our three respective networks have been involved in designing the agenda, and I have taken some of the suggested measures um, and included them on this slide. Um, it's not all of them; it's just a few of them. And um, I think it, when you read through it, it becomes pretty obvious that some of these measures um, are joint interest for all of us. So for example, exploiting the use of new technologies is um, basically a no brainer. Uh, we will hear a little bit later on um, uh, how we have cooperated in this field. And some of these joint interests and joint suggested measures will be illustrated a little bit later on. But there are also some of them which might not be so obvious. So, for example, the first one, um, primary school. Um, we've heard in the beginning of Eirik who said that it's a priority for the AEC. Um, and the AEC, of course, they are the ones who educate teachers who will later on work in primary schools. It's pretty obvious that it's also a priority for the EIS. Um, but when it comes to the EMU, this is also this might be a little bit less obvious, but it's certainly also something that we strongly support because we do not see it as a competition, but rather we see it as again a complementarity. Um, we music schools usually have the resources and the know how to contribute to and help um, music education primary school and the working reality in Europe is that there are many, many collaborations between music schools and primary schools. Um, it certainly helps to extend the reach of music schools so. Um, uh, there are certainly lots of families who do not have a tradition of educating, of teaching about music, who are difficult to reach from a music school. However, if you get in touch with them in a primary school and you raise or you um, incite a certain interest in learning about music, you might take it from there and you might get people into music schools that you have never um, 
that you would never have reached otherwise. So um, to, to sum this up, some priority, some of these suggested measures are bigger priorities for some of us, but I think um, all the measures, these ones and the, uh, and the full list in the agenda are measures that are relevant for all of us, even though to a varying degree of priority, I would say. And um, the interesting thing about this is that um, having done this exercise of basically writing down um, all these uh, interests and all these visions and all these goals has really created a common basis for uh, further cooperation. And in a moment, we will go a little bit into um, what we have built on it. But I just wanted to share one more thought, um, because taking the example of us having different, having some complementarities and having a joint basis in the agenda, it kind of reminds me of, um, of the, the entire music sector as such. Um, the EMC is trying to, is on the impossible mission, let's say, to um, gather all these um, different interests and all these different areas of the music sector, which can be conflicting sometimes. There's certainly a difference between the culture and creative industries and the classical high culture. They are between businesses and um, institutions that um, are publicly funded. Um, there are differences between musical traditions, musical cultures, musical genres, and so on. And it's not easy to converge all these voices. And I think one masterpiece that was done in this, in this sense are certainly the five music rights, which um, have managed to bring together all these joint interests. And um, if you look at the statutes of the EMC, you see the five music uh, rights on page number one, and I think um, this is quite important because they they form the basis on which I don't know 40, 50 years of history of the EMC have been built upon, and um, I think this is a good illustration of how powerful having a um, a joint basis, a joint understanding, even if it's just very basic, the power of it is, becomes obvious when you look at the five music rights. And in a way, um, I might be oversimplifying things a little bit, but um, you might say that the European agenda for music, for us, it works in a way that it's maybe a bit more specific and a bit more focused and potentially a bit more European-centered um, version of the five music rights. And eventually it brings us together and allows us to take it from there and to build into to build up greater corporations to explore other topics which we seem relevant and eventually it unites these networks and I think um, coming back to what I initially said in the very early stages of the work on the agenda we um, heard this phrase a lot the united music sector is a strong sector and in that sense this is um, what having a joint basis in uh, the agenda has done for us so um, implementing the agenda has meant um, uniting um, us even more in a certain sense. And uh, I think this is what um, this can be considered a success story in that sense. So um, this was just uh, some short thoughts or some reflections on um, how we see the agenda. Um, I would now give back the floor to Stefan because um, what we want to do in the next session is to explore a little bit more some of the topics on which we have cooperated and some of the joint interest um, which we have uh, worked on uh, in the past. So please, Stefan. Yeah, thank you very much, Till. Uh, I think uh, on my list we, had, we would also have the, give you the possibility to ask questions. Uh, if so, please use the chat room and we will try also before the breakout groups maybe finding the opportunity to have some kind of question answers slot. Um, yes, um, my task is to talk about uh, why does music education matters to anyone and that means not only to professionals not only to specialists and uh, i will take the opportunity to share once more with you my screen um yes here we are in accordance with the five music rights music and music education is an universal human right every human being must have access to 
That's what this paper from 2001 states. The idea that culture and cultural activities should be accessible to everyone is not at all new and basically roots back to ancient times. You might know these three guys. And the Roman chronicler Tacitus was commissioned to make a kind of ethnological inventory of the tribes living north of the Alps, wrote about those who lived at the south bank of the North Sea at the time, Frisia non cantat, the Frisians don't sing. Tacitus just couldn't imagine that there were human beings on this planet who did not sing, not even among barbarians. Sorry, I did not want to blame the Dutch. I know you made a lot of progress since. When the idea of compulsory schooling arose in Europe in the 18th century and was gradually implemented in the 19th century, it was clear that singing would be a mandatory part of the subjects to teach. In the second half of the 20th century, new ideas came up. Playing an instrument promotes personality development, the ability to be focused, and social competence. Concepts and projects such as El Sistema, Rhythm Is It, or Jedem Kind Ein Instrument discovered music as a medium of social work. At this point, I would like to quote from the introduction of one of the oldest curricula ever written in Europe for an elementary school, a school that should be open to all children, even in the most remote villages of the country. It is the Lithuanian school plan from 189. This paper distinguishes between five different modes in which a young person encounters the world. <clears throat> and therefore, it provides that all these five modes must be represented in the curriculum at eye level. The five modes that are mentioned are language, historical knowledge, math, gymnastics, we would rather say sport today, and aesthetic experience. The ratio behind it is that these modes are each unique and cannot replace one another. The idea is shaped by the enlightenment in humanism, which continues to have an impact on how we think about education and school to this day. The message behind is there is no education without cultural education. And let me add here, uh, just because this might, uh, might look a little bit Eurocentric at the moment, that uh, in the last 20 years, since the beginning of this millennium, many stimulants and impulses to, uh, to transport that ID came from outside the Western world. So not only with the five music rights, but also with the 2010 so-called soul agenda, just to name that. However, I can still tell the story also from the other side, not from the perspective of an individual, but from the perspective of a commercial enterprise that has to constantly improve this product and keep them up to date in order to stay a competitive player on the market. Many of them are specifically looking for employees with so-called creative skills. I served a couple of websites from human resource departments in big enterprises and was looking for what they understand by creative skills they are looking for. And that what, what I found was a bit randomly, but typically I think, discipline, curiosity, open-mindedness, playfulness, and to be able to question everything. Creative skills are learned through dealing with the arts and as a result of cultural education. That at least what I assume that they assume because these people quite often refer to people like Albert Einstein, who is claimed to have spent more time playing the violin than in the laboratory. Yes, that's just the image. But let's go back to the topic. Almost two years ago, the European Commission published a paper on the importance of lifelong learning, which states, today, young people need a broad set of competences to find fulfilling jobs and become independent. Engaged citizens, increasing the level of key competences is at the heart of the European education area, a space where all young people should receive the best education regardless of their background. I see, um, I mean, uh, yes, just these are, these are the list of the eight key competences. They see that cultural awareness and expression competence, as they call it, is on the list, the last bullet point. Maybe the last might not be the, the, the less important ones. But uh, you see here that creativity is seen as a key competence also to, to become or to be 
a human being which contributes which contributes to economic contact competitiveness and uh, even though i know that some musicians and music educators strongly dislike these kind of arguments what are said to exploit art for other purposes i think it is rather a great achievement that the european U uh, union lists cultural awareness and expression competence as one of the eight competences in lifelong learning. Eirik earlier mentioned an, another acronym which is uh, resonating with a very similar background, the STEM, which became STEAM. And uh, STEAM is not only the more, much more powerful word, but it includes also the arts. And I think this is a big step forward. Uh, in the meantime, also the European Commission has taken ownership of this acronym and I'm proud to say that it is also due to the advocacy work done by the scheme group. By the way, if you carefully read uh, official documents of the European Commission, you might get aware that there is never talked about art, but only about culture and creativity. And I'm, uh, I think it's, it's a good thing that the, one of the first times, maybe not the first time ever, art is included as an expression here in these kind of very brief statements. And uh, it shouldn't have been the last time. To sum up, why does music education matters to everyone? Because there's no education without cultural education and there is no social coherent society without cultural, cultural aware citizens. This is by no means a new idea, but the way in which we are the driving forces of the music education sector contribute to making these things a reality is changing. And we are experiencing this in a very particular way during this pandemic, pandemic. Thanks for your attention. Oh, so thank, thank you, Stefan. Also, um, I just saw in the chat that um, there have not been any any questions, and I don't see any raised hands. So, um, if if you don't mind, I will not ask any questions myself for the sake of not running too late. I would um, we will still have a chance to in the in breakout groups later on. Um, I would rather uh, now move on and give the word to Sandrine Demure. Sandrine is a, a trainer and an information technologies manager at the Cefedem in France. Um, but she's also a member of the joint working group on digitization uh, that the EAS, the AEC and the EMU have um, created within the frame of the SMS project. So um, Sandrine will introduce quickly what this working group has done in the last three years. It's a four year project, it's running for one more year and um, Sandrine will give you a short outlook. Sandrine, please. Thank you, Tia. Good morning, everyone. I'm really glad to be here with you today to talk about this uh, working group. Um, so uh, we we are uh, seven members from. Uh, uh, let me let me not say you stupidities. We are from uh, Barcelona, from Barcelona, from Lyon, from Bristol, from London, from uh, uh, German, uh, Germany, from uh, um, and from Belgium. And we are all uh, involved in the strains of the SMS uh, uh, project named Digitization Teacher Education in the Digital Age. Um, our main goal at the beginning of the SMS project was to collect and to map practices and examples of the use and the needs of the digital learning. And we wanted also to develop a vision concerning the integration of uh, new technology in music learning and teaching, and to offer some uh, guidance uh, for an exploration of this new field. So for the first uh, uh, goal, we launch uh, a call to learn about the ongoing digitization projects all over Europe. Uh, and just to explain, it was uh, uh, prior to the outbreak of the pandemic um, crisis. So our questionnaire was sent widely uh, to all the members of the AEC and to uh, all the partner organizations, EAS and MU partner, to collect information on the existing digitization projects. We received uh, 78 projects uh, from uh, 36 cities. And uh, based on the, re re the responses of this questionnaire, we wanted to 
to map the current landscape of uh, digital projects in Europe. Um, just to, to try to build an uh, understanding on the, the why, the what, and the how uh, digitization uh, um, shape or transform or uh, 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 exist in our institution and in music education. Uh, to establish the, our questionnaire, we, uh, we used two, um, two strategies. The one was based on uh, uh, the SMS project and the categorization we, we, um, we decided to use from the strength of the SMS project. Because at the beginning of this huge project, we realized that digitization were everywhere. Uh, because uh, when we are talking about internationalization, when we are talking about entrepreneurship, when we are talking about uh, um, music creation, when we are talking about learning and teaching, and when we are talking about diversity and inclusiveness, we are talking also about maybe digitization, because it can be a tool to, uh, to build more inclusiveness, to build more uh, entrepreneurial skills, and so on. So we wanted to know if uh, digitization were linked uh, in a certain way, in all this uh, uh, manner of dealing with digitization. So we build a categorization and we asked the respondent to explain uh, where were um, the, the function and the social role of uh, their, digitiz their digitization project. And we also uh, wanted to have another strategy and to, to get some information, uh, as we said, from bottom to up and to, uh, to build categorization based on the keywords, based on the goal, based on the main uh, objectives of the project we collect. And then uh, with all this response, we, 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 we tried and uh, we tried to build the map. And we can say that prior to the pandemic, most of the projects we get were um, um, most of the time linked to learning and teaching projects and uh, were linked to uh, the question of access, giving access to knowledge. But we, we can see that uh, um, um, there were a lack of projects concerning uh, research uh, on IT and uh, on uh, artistic projects linked to uh, the use of the digital tools in the artistic practices. But uh, the pandemic crisis uh, happened and um, we, um, we all struggled uh, with the, the question and the issues and the new way of, uh, of doing things. We have all the uh, experience through uh, these years. So uh, for, for us, the, the, the second goal was really important. We tried to, to, to feed the community with research, with reflection, with uh, new questions uh, to, to build some knowledge, some common culture, some digital literacy, because it, it, it seems for us it was really important to, to maybe to, to stop a little bit the urgent time, to take time to think about what is digitization in uh, uh, the music field, in the artistic field in general. And um, uh, we are uh, trying to, um, to build some uh, uh, critical thinking about uh, all this uh, uh, field. And uh, we, um, we are writing articles on the website of the uh, uh, SMS project. Uh, and uh, we are uh, working on the preparation of the workshop for the EMU, uh, which will uh, uh, take place uh, at the end of April. Um, and uh, just to, to, to uh, there is a, a, a very important sentence uh, in our group. Uh, that uh, maybe uh, about uh, digitization, we are, we are always saying that uh, we can be inspired by technology, but we must be driven by pedagogy. And uh, this is a really a, um, um, an important sentence for this working group to deal with and to keep in mind that uh, we need to, to focus on what we are doing with tools and how we can build new skills uh, for the students and for um, our, our staff members, because we need new competencies and new skills to, to work on digitization. Thank you.
Thank you, Sandrine. Um, again, I've, I've had a look at the chat window and I've looked at, had a look at raised hands. I could not see any questions. And again, being sensitive of time, I would also suggest that we um, directly move on so um, to make sure we do not run late. Um, again, as I said, there will be breakout groups. There will be an opportunity for exchange in case some questions come up. But for now, I would give the word to Dr. Tade Buchhorn from the University of Music in um, Freiburg, if I'm not mistaken. And he's also from the network of DAS, and he will be elaborating a little bit more on um, teacher education. Yes, thank you very much uh, from Freiburg. Greetings from Freiburg while my PowerPoint is loading. Um, I'm very happy to be here to talk about educating the next generation of music teachers. Listening, dancing, singing, songwriting, discussing an album, playing, visiting a concert or reading your favorite band's blog. Music is what people do. Music is a central activity in people's lives. And music is a way of dealing with the world that cannot be replaced by any other. This is why music, uh, why access to music is a human right. In order to support this, music education is part of school education in many countries. One central goal is to make music education and teacher training inclusive and accessible for all. But where are we now? Our research shows that music teachers in Germany differentiate between the music cultures of the learners, their own musical world, and what is taught in the classroom. In the future, I hope this graph will look like this. Music education should connect with learners' expertise in music. Music in school should offer all learners new ways of approaching music and music education should support to meet the rich musical diversity of our times. Because music is what learners do, and music is what teachers do. However, is music teacher training accessible for all who do music? Again, a story from Germany. She can study in more than 50 universities at conservatoires doing music teacher training programs. He can only study at less than 40 and she can only study at one institution in our country. Changing this is a central task for the future in my point of view. Music teacher training has to become a mirror of the diverse musical practices of our times. Meeting multiple ways of doing music would make music education more accessible and inclusive for learners and teachers. In a music teacher training for all, music teachers have to be trained as musicians and researchers to gain knowledge in and about music and musical practices. And they have to get opportunities to build up their competences and skills as educators. In our study programs, these fields have to be interwoven as music teachers in practice have to act as music educators, artists and researchers at the same time. Understanding music as a social practice can help us to redesign our music curricula and our teacher training programs for the future. We have to include artists from a wider range of musical practices in teacher training. These teachers of the future should learn to act as artists, researchers and educators in their practices in school. This will help them to make music education accessible for all learners. And so music will be what people will do in the future. Thank you all for listening. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy now to give the floor to uh, do Dominic, Dominic uh, Ruiz Silva, who is a, a member of the European Parliament uh, since recently. It's his first term, so to say, and also one of the members of the cult committee, which is so to say dealing with culture and education both uh, at the same time, and also a member of the very proactive group of members of this cult committee, which is a cultural uh, uh, creative friendship group. Uh, Dominic, your the floor is yours. Uh, many thanks, <clears throat> Stefan. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Um, 
I'm sorry I uh, I joined a bit late, but I, I had a confusion because I was using a link that uh, requested me to to use a password to connect that I didn't have, and then uh, that delayed me. But I I been able to to listen um, a little bit. Um, so thanks for for the invitation. Greetings to everyone um, to this semin to this webinar on on the access to music education in in europe in europe as i said i will have liked to listen a bit more to the seminar uh, but um, the uh, the invitation this, the reminder of the invitation to participate caught my attention a bit late uh, so my mistake so i have other appointments uh, in the morning um, but um, you had invited me also for a bilateral meeting so i also look forward to to that uh, because certainly i i'm uh, very much committed to advance uh, music education i i am of the opinion that um, uh, we should not look at music as uh, something uh, for uh, particularly talented children or for those particularly interested or with sensibility to it I think it should be an integral part of um, of the education um, uh, at the same level of uh, science, uh, technology, mathematics, language. It's an integral part of the development of, of the personality um, and of the general sensibility of a person, uh, not only towards music, but towards culture in general. Um, so in this regard, um, at the policy level, we have done already some, some work with the, uh, the push for uh, STEAM education, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. And we have been, as I said, pushing in order to have STEAM includes arts and of course, mu music education. Um, it is very important that young citizens are exposed to a wide spectrum of knowledge and skills. And uh, as I said before, um, I remember when I was uh, in a school, in primary school, that uh, music education, uh, music class, sorry, uh, was considered a minor uh, subject. Um, and um, if a child were to fail that class, uh, parents will not be very tough on that uh, child, as if that child was unable to pass uh, now the mathematics class or, or the language class. And um, of course, I'm talking of a, of a personal experience of, of 30 years ago. Uh, I hope things have changed. Uh, and, and if not, uh, we are in, uh, in big trouble, certainly, uh, um, because it is not the case that is a minor subject at all. And uh, as I said, um, not only is fundamental for the general development of the child and the person and the future citizen, but um, the lack of cultural um, uh, of the lack of, yes, of music culture, not just music education, but knowledge about the different musical currents, um, uh, the inability to play and not even one simple instrument um, really is, is, is not good for, for society. No? And um, even if we are looking at children that want to be scientists or, or young people that want to be scientists. Uh, as I said before, having artistic skills and social sensibility makes uh, also the person, but the work, the professional, um, the professional bet better. I have here information, for example, that, uh, well, of course we are, are, are not, I don't mean to elevate anything to category, but um, Nobel Prize winners in science are more likely to have artistic uh, hobbies and artistic training than, than standard scientists. No? 
Uh, and of course, if we don't invest in music education, we will have less musicians and singers, which makes a terrible vision for, for, the, for the future. Something I have been emphasizing, for example, in the context of the, uh, of the new European Bauhaus initiative, I don't know if you heard about it, that von der Leyen talk about in the State of the Union. And then, of course, um, Commissioner Maria Gabriel has taken up uh, is that this should not be a construction, a project to promote construction or architectural projects, but it should be a truly uh, interdisciplinary, multidimensional, co creative effort. And I have always emphasized that when every time the commissioner and others take the floor to say this is a project for engineers, architects and artists, they should say specifically also writers, poets and musicians. It should be a project um, for them as well. I think um, that we have to look at the overall uh, theme of education and culture in the conference on the future of Europe, because of course, uh, we can do a lot raising awareness in the cool committee, uh, asking the commission to come up with the strategies and initiatives to support education and culture, in this case, music education. I have also been involved in promoting, for example, citizenship education, which I think is also a major uh, gap that we have in, in Europe. Uh, but of course, you know that the, we have very limited competencies, unfortunately, in these fields at the European level. We can do a lot with support uh, competencies, but I think we need a reflection also in order to give concrete competence to the, to the European Union in the European dimension of education and culture. And I hope the Conference on the Future of Europe could be an opportunity, and I encourage you as active members of the organized civil society to join the civil society platform that has been already created by civil, so civil society Europe in order to engage and influence directly the, the work of this conference. So uh, again, sorry, I have uh, to go now. Uh, my team will remain in the, in the meeting. So I, uh, they will report to me uh you know everything you say so we can continue uh working together later on thanks a lot thank you very much looking forward to meet you thanks bye thanks yes well this was really certainly helpful as as, as we said a few times today uh, it was important for us to um approach the topic of music education from different angles so um we're really glad that we could also get um, just a sort of insight um, from the perspective of the of the EU and the EU Parliament uh, specifically. Maybe just real quick, I would like to pass on the word to um, Stefan first to just have a short word about what he will be presenting in his group, what he will be discussing. Yeah, we just decided that we very briefly in 20 seconds would say uh, each of us three what we're talking about to make it easier to, 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 uh, to make a choice. So I will talk about uh, uh, the excellence and diversity as leading paradigms for higher music education, contradictions or complements. It is a task of European music higher education institutions to educate young music talents and to make them becoming top artists Music HEIs shall a breeding ground for the big names of tomorrow. Still, the threshold only to pass the entrance examination is very high. More and more, we are uh, often we are asked, and I think um, for right, how inclusive are music HEIs? How can we make music higher education institutions more diverse, opening the windows and doors wider than we have done in the past to other cultures, other genres, other social layers? Do we need a new understanding of quality and success? And if so, which one? Thanks. And I think Isolde will be chairing the group on behalf of the EAS. Yes, I will quickly introduce Breakout Room 2. We had the issue sometimes today already in the European Agenda for Music. The first suggested measure for the category of education to access and access to music is make music a compulsory subject from primary school on. And we know that this is covered very differently in the countries. 
in our breakout room too, we will share strategies, turning points that you experienced in your countries or also future strategies that you can think of in your context and region and share them and hope to strengthen ourselves by that. Feel free to come. Okay, yeah. So very quickly for the breakout group three, uh, while we while face to face teaching still plays a central role in some forms of music education, group lessons are becoming increasingly important. This hot topic challenges music education throughout Europe, as shown last December in a very successful seminar organized by the Philharmonie de Paris. And this is a subject we regularly address in EMU seminars not as a fight between face-to-face -face and group lesson, but as an opportunity for music pedagogy. In this workshop, we will exchange on the different aspects of this question from the point of view of the diversity of pedagogical situations, curricula, repertoires, student evaluations, and teachers training. And I will be very happy to welcome you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for uh, joining this group. I just let me say uh, in the very beginning that um, I just wanted to, and I hope I'm, I will succeed as, as, at least with this point to share a white screen with you in order to ask you to fill in a couple of keywords, uh, what you understand by uh, diversity or uh, to say it more precisely, uh, what kind of diversity do we talk about when we are talking about making uh, music education institutions more diverse? And I want to say the, the here that I, I am uh, representing in the higher, so to say, the higher education sector. But nevertheless, uh, this is also uh, crucial for the for even for primary school, for music schools, or whatever uh, kind of music uh, education. I think, but keeping in mind that the future generation of music teachers who are active in these fields are usually, or most of them, so to say, educated, um, maybe at the moment and in the future, uh, in one of these uh, institutions, which are we are representing as higher uh, music education uh, association, so to say. Uh, this is at least indirectly, uh, anyway, uh, of great significance. And so let's not forget, forget about these other places, even if we talk about now, maybe about how to make uh, higher education institutions more open and more diverse. So that now I try to share my whiteboard with you. And so you should be able now to write in whatever. And please let me know if you don't have access to it. So maybe uh, the, the whiteboard is is uh, is already quite uh, full, and uh, let me say it, it's very interesting. You, you see it, uh, anyone? I think uh, uh, it started by uh, mostly talking about styles or genres or however you would call it, and uh, my. But there are also all the other aspects, and I I think the the one which are uh, really someone which is uh, so to say covering the whole field is. Uh, the fear to lose excellence that leads us, of course, to the maybe to the question: What is excellence? Maybe we need a redefinition of of excellence. And the other thing is, I would say, um, staff working processes with music. I mean, to open up to, let's say, to teachers who have, or to more interdisciplinarity. I would talk it uh, uh, to in, uh, in increase, uh, let's say, uh, an, an overall uh, look at it. Um, maybe uh, I think uh, we should. Is anyone uh, have any any questions? Maybe on on the uh, on those terms and which are what's standing on the so far in the whiteboard. Maybe I would start a first uh, question and uh, please raise your hands uh, if you want to contribute. Uh, preferably your electronic hand. I do not know if I see all of you. Um, and uh, to ask, what was it here? 
Um, I'm looking for. Um, I mean, if you talk about uh, different musical cultures or bringing in more um, equal access regardless of ethnic backgrounds, um, I think we are often speaking about a different kind of, of understanding of music, musical quality and how, how to open up an institution to these kind yeah. of... Uh, of different kind of understanding uh, of quality and of uh, with it, how to bring them in in this in an existing system. That would be my main question, maybe. Is there anyone who wants to? Um, I recently, um, I work for NAM. Um, some of you know, know of us. We recently had an event um, that was called Believe in Music Week. And at the very end, we had um, a, a rally for music, a grand rally for music education. And at that event, we had um, my colleague, Mary, who is the executive director of the NAM Foundation. She interviewed um, Renee Fleming and Dr. Nina Krauss, but then also Gustavo Dudamel, and one of the students from the Youth Orchestra of Los Angeles. And I think one of the things that he said that really stuck with me, uh, I don't know, Simone, whether you were able to attend that particular session, um, was that just because you have you know, poor students um, in, your, um, in your youth orchestra doesn't mean that you have to give them or teach them poor culture. And I think um, that really sort of, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, that was not his, his exact words, but I, I think that really sort of paraphrased to me the, um, the, the sometimes the problems that we have, particularly in the West, when we look at, 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 at curricula, et cetera, et cetera, to, to, to be judgmental about what groups can bring or should bring or are allowed to bring um, to the table. So I, I just thought I'd throw that in um, maybe as a conversation starter. Thanks. What is poor culture? Well, I meant he, he, he was talking about, um, he was talking about um, teaching excellence, that it doesn't actually matter who you have in front of you, who you're teaching. It means you have to apply, um, you want to apply the same kind of standards. You want to be an excellent teacher of excellent music. He wasn't judgmental in saying it only has to be the Western um, sort of acoustic tradition of, of symphonic music. He was talking about the fact that you don't, you, 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 you still push your students, you don't water it down. Um, you continue to apply high standards. Yeah. Any comments on that? Yes, I, I could jump in if you like. Yes. Um, I, I can actually um, directly add an idea uh, of Elsa's Thema, we invited last week uh, to our lectures at Music University a uh, couple of alumni uh, from uh, Venezuela, Elsa's Thema, and they underlined um, the, F, uh, the aspect that if we are uh, uh, focusing, although the question of this breakout session group here, um, how we can combine the question of uh, reaching everyone, including everyone, and also the idea of excellence somehow, how we can bring this together. Is it a contradiction or not? And they, um, and we saw pretty, pretty clear that actually the, the reaching, uh, my English is not the perfect, uh, I hope you understand me, but uh, the uh, reaching everyone, although uh, going in the, in the borough tourism uh, is actually um, underlined or empowered by the promise of excellence. Uh, so that you that can somehow, you can leave Venezuela maybe, you can leave to Caracas, you can uh, go somewhere. And that's turned out somehow as a problem and maybe it's somehow related to the model of classical music. That's one point. Um, so that's one point. And the other idea I just want to share short and then I'm finished. Um, it's the question how we can limit the power of institutions, um, uh, maybe uh, who are related uh, to music. Uh, because I, I see there a little bit of risk um, that as more we give in one institution in Europe or in some, I, I think the diversity we can only reach if we, we keep it. <laughs> okay. 
Thanks. Uh, I think uh, Eleanor was next. Yes, um, I feel that um, the question of excellence in many cases is still tainted by questions of taste and non-understanding of different styles. What would be the criteria that we would need to use to describe excellence? Thanks in a, a multi-genre situation or diversity situation. Carol? Yes, I wonder if there's anything we can learn from the world of sport in terms of excellence. It doesn't really seem to be any problem at all that um, sporting people are, are excellent and that's recognised as something to strive for and to be supported in every way. Um, and I just wonder if, yeah, if there's something we can learn from that. Okay, thanks. Uh, Guillermo? Didn't rise its hand anymore. Yeah, this is Stefan. Yes, maybe for me there is a misunderstanding about excellence in the way that uh, we consider this at a professional level and higher level, but not at all from the beginning of the training. And um, uh, the question for me is what is the real utility of music practice? And this is not considered at all how people, how uh, uh, students, uh, pupils can learn music for something else than music that they will practice in their life. And on the other hand, um, the excellence is often seen by teachers uh, from their own perspective and their own discipline not enough and, and sometimes not at all from the, the person, the student's perspective. Do you have a hands-on idea how to change that? Well, maybe introducing um, uh, the question of pedagogy, of utility of, of music artistic practice in the very beginning of training in, in music schools, not only in high education and um, analyzing the process of making music and giving inputs to teachers and to students on how they can use this in, in, their, in any practice, in any teaching, mathematics, etc. And also working with other teachers in mathematics, science, etc. on what can be um, useful with music in their teaching. Yeah, thanks, uh, Tade. It's very shortly, I think you can transfer that uh, to the artistic sector. I mean, there's a problem with the excellent and the comparison with sports. In sports, you can say if someone is running faster, he's running faster. But in music, uh, it's, uh, it's very much individual um, and uh, based on taste, uh, who's excellent and who's not. And I think this is the big difference and we have to be aware of that in the arts. Okay, thank you. And this older, maybe you can just start. <laughs> Hello, yeah. I think some people will uh, still join us I'm very happy to see you all and I already see that you come from very diverse regions of Europe. I will do it quite quickly so that we really can enter our uh, work. Um, I prepared a map, an interactive map, and I will show it to you, where in a first step you can, uh, you can post strategies that you're using in your countries. Uh, you might and maybe also in the end, we can print it out in a PDF and you can see all the countries and all the strategies together and we will send it around. So we have a written result as well as a discussion background. Good luck. Another two minutes. So either you finish your own post or you travel around in Europe to read what others have written. And you can also think about who you want to ask something from the strategies you see. To open the discussion, I would like to have a look at some strategies and pose some direct questions to the person. So 
if you see something that interests you, or would you like to know how does this work exactly? How did you do this in your country or how does this work? Um, then raise your hand if you want to ask something. We will start the discussion by this. There is a clap by Thomas. Is this a raise your hand? Yes. <laughs> Thomas, I did, please. I didn't know what, 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 what to click. <laughs> Fine. Uh, just maybe two thoughts. I, I opened some some uh, of the contributions. The, there was one contribution in the sea. Um, in the sea, yes. Which addresses the idea that okay, we can we can we can ask for more uh, for a more secure place of music in the schools. But what do we then exactly mean with this? What kind of practices are we then putting central? I think this is an interesting topic to have a discussion about. Uh, and another thing I saw, there were some contributions, maybe one about this big action that is going on in uh, my neighbor country, the Netherlands. And maybe it's also nice to, to share some information about this project, Mere Music in the Class, and who contributed it. But it can be a nice topic to, to, to get some information about. So maybe the person who posted that can answer. The post in the sea, in the Atlantic Sea. <laughs> Anonymous. No, I posted in the Atlantic Sea, but I, yes, what I posted yeah. was that, that um, for me, it's always problematic to only, in inverted commas, ask for um, compulsory music education. Now, I could have also used the word quality, but quality is always problematic because it needs to be defined. But I think what is crucial for me is that it must include participatory music making and for me it must include singing <laughs> i mean i come from the european call association of Canta, but i think singing as the most natural uh, um, expression um, at least in elementary school should be compulsory within music education so what i wanted to say is it's it, it has to come also with some mm -hmm. miniature curriculum demands and not just as an independent demand and i posted it in the atlantic because it was for all of europe <laughs> yeah perfect thank you I uh, I did uh, do the post about uh, more music in the class, more, more music in the classroom, and um, it's an initi initiative. I'm not um, uh, working there or anything, so um, I I know it, <laughs> it 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 exists, and it's um, uh, they work with uh, like energizers by uh, uh, some uh, more famous people in the Netherlands that, that do uh, little videos with songs or uh, in, uh, to energize uh, uh, their short videos to use in the classroom and also to make um, uh, uh, teachers, uh, so not music teachers, but uh, normal teachers, so to say, um, um, to uh, use music in a classroom and in an uh, easy way. So, uh, of course, uh, um, I also think that music education should be more into the schools, but to begin with, uh, if you can bring it into the classroom again, because uh, for a long time there wasn't that much music education in schools. So yeah. there, um, yeah. I'm a bit looking at the time, we have another two minutes. What I hear is about um, also facilitating music uh, teachers that have, are not specialists with good tools so that they can bring yes. uh, music into yes. classrooms very well. I have, Sam, I have Sandra, I, and then Ian and Alma. Please, Sandra. Uh, hi, I didn't uh, have time to read all the proposals, but, no uh, but, I, was think, <laughs> but I was thinking that um, one of the strategies would be that uh, teaching music in schools uh, should be not only like a school curriculum, but I think it would be useful if uh, music as a cultural expression should be um, emphasized. I mean, if music teachers didn't only teach music, but also, you know, uh, going outside, seeing music on the streets, cultural manifestations, amateur music uh, is a huge part of it. Yeah. Like not, not only teaching music as, as a subject or as an abstract thing, but uh, just emphasizing how important is music to our mm -hmm. everyday lives, in our culture, traditions, you know, each region, each town, uh, they have their own traditions. And I think yeah. it would be very nice, uh, since sometimes music is seen as a boring subject or useless subject. Uh, and I think if we could approach it from this social, you know, working to together embed with, it. The, with yeah. society, then music would uh, be seen as something really important and not yeah. just as, as um, um, 
<clears throat> Dominic said that it's the typical subject that it's okay if you fail it because it's not as important as maths. And Thank you, Sandra. And you put it into your post, isn't it? So that we uh, have it there. I just didn't do it. write it, but I would. But do I it. Will. Ian, <laughs> Thank you. Ian, if we just, I think we have some minutes left. Uh, just uh, hello, everybody. Uh, Hi. It's great to see so many, <clears throat> so many people on the call. My point, which I've just sent to Isolde, is uh, and something I've discussed a lot with Sonia over these last years when I've been working with the European Music Council, is that music and sport should be looked at in the same, absolutely the same category, because without participation, neither exist. And it's as simple as that. And yet, you know, I'm a great football fan uh, and, and I love sport. Uh, I love music even more, of course. But when we try to separate the participation element, especially in primary school, we get into trouble. Uh, and when you have non-specialist primary school teachers uh, who are expected to teach everything, which sometimes is impossible, then if they are a sport fan, they are happy with sport. They may know nothing about music, so music completely disappears from the primary school curriculum because it's not written down. And that's why at the beginning of the European Agenda for Music, this was very controversial when we said music must be compulsory because then we had 27 voices first, then everyone else in the European community jumping up and down and saying, ah, oh, but it's impossible in my country. It can't be compulsory. So we were not stating uh, a, a policy fact, we were stating an ambition that should be mm -hmm. the case throughout Europe. But the point that Sonia has made and uh, Stefan made in his earlier presentation about singing, you can sing a solo voice is fantastic and it's the most difficult of techniques, uh, but it's very difficult to play football on your own, <laughs> on ball. Yes. So I use that analogy all the time. I have two grandchildren who are crazy about sport uh, and we are trying to lean them a little towards music uh, with some success. But that's my point. It's the participation element that brings children together, not often the subject itself. Thank you so much. I had Alma with a raised hand as well. We have another uh, good, one minute left. Okay, I, I will try to be very quick. Um, good, good day to everyone. I am uh, reaching from uh, Sarajevo to all of you. And I had um, one point or maybe an idea to share with you how we are trying to resolve this uh, intensifying of participation of non-special teachers uh, uh, teaching music and primary music school. Mm -hmm. For the past four years, I have been artistic director of SuperAR, uh, an association that is very closely linked to El Sistema method and that is actually trying to offer music, quality music education to all uh, without any segregation or any uh, uh, audition or really trying to give it to everybody. So here in Superar in Sarajevo in Bosnia, we are trying to do this by entering uh, school curricula and uh, offering it to the teachers in primary music schools for the beginning in Canton, in Canton Sarajevo. Uh, right now, we have been involved with more than uh, three or four hundred children in the past. So we will years. meet in two seconds in the main room. See you there. Okay. <laughs> So if I have some more minutes, I am just trying to say that through our activities within the classrooms of the teachers who are not uh, primarily music educators, uh, we are giving uh, this education to the children at the same time as we are offering the support for the teachers who are not specialists probably in music. So they are giving their, uh, let's say, mentoring from professional musicians, uh, me, myself being a conductor by profession and my other colleagues who are also music professionals. So we are trying to approach this problem heads on uh, uh, with the kids and with the resident teachers at the same time. And I have to say that we are moving along slowly but very efficiently upwards. And we are trying to stay in touch with all of our other colleagues from the European countries that also have this or similar pro education, the possibility to go deeper 
with one single student, taking, taking into account the personality and abilities of each student, the fear of decreasing level, of a decreasing level of the music institutions and students, and finally the desire to maintain a model and habits that have proven themselves over many decades. Considering this, it seems to me not necessary to engage a debate for or against face-to-face -face learning or, or group lessons. It would be a sterile debate and would not propose real solutions to move forward. So it seems more productive to discuss, to discuss about the different pedagog pedagogical situations you, you may have to face and how to deal with them and maybe to mention the needs we may have in these different situations. For example, and just to be short and to introduce the debate, some questions. What are the pedagogical tools that a music teacher needs today when facing a class in a, a, class in a school or facing a group in an El Sistema type project? How to welcome children coming from such projects in a music school? How can the quality of teaching be improved in the frame of group lessons? How to combine individual and group teaching? Are the repertoires sufficient or should they be developed? And last but not least, is the training of music teachers enough adapted to face these new challenges? So I would be now very happy to hear you about those questions or others, considering that the goal is not to find solutions today, but rather to bring your reflections and your needs to the level of our European organizations in order to act and move forward together on this issue. So please, who would like to speak first? Maybe you can raise your hand virtually and Till is going to give you the floor. So yes, Dorothy. Thank you for joining us. Can you present yourself in a, in a few words, please? And you have to, to put your microphone on. Good morning, everybody. Dorothy Conaghan uh, from University College Dublin, studying equality studies and social justice, but with a 30 year career in music education. And as Till and Philippe know, I have been an advocate for about 20 years on group tuition, not to replace, but to enhance and to open up, um, I suppose, music that would not normally be available to children in society. I think, um, Philippe, you have wonderfully and succinctly, you know, listed all the issues and the debate areas that we need to approach this. And with more dialogue, I think fear will go away because the fear of group tuition is something that has actually held back the rhetoric and the dialogue. Um, but I do think something that underpins all of your questions, Philippe, and this is something that might uh, be relevant in different countries, is your actual structure of teaching. And I have a little bit of a, a sort of a dilemma when I'm researching this is that I, I am a, a full time re researcher for equality and of access to music education. I have a little bit of dilemma about projects. And I think projects have to become policy. And the reason why I say that is in my 20 years working on group tuition in schools, there was no policy the underpinning, the actual teaching I was doing and the 22 schools I planted projects in. And as a result, when something happens politically or economically in a country, they are the first, because they are only projects, we disappoint the subjects of the programs. And that's the first thing, because we cannot economically sustain. And the second thing is, you know, we did teacher training, we did education of parents, we did all of the welcoming, you know, students in, got them to like it. But the second thing we did, apart from underpinning it with policy structures, is the corridors, and that is part of it, corridors of um, continuation. And if you think of it like reading and writing, we show all children how to read and write. 
but we actually have corridors for them. They're not all going to become playwrights or poets, but if they so wish, we have corridors within our um, compulsory education system for these to continue. And if that's missing in the music education, we are showing children a carrot they cannot have. And that's why I have actually dedicated my current research in the university to uh, policy and provision advocacy. So I would like to hear, do other people have um, ideas on that? Everybody is very Thank quiet, Philippe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dorothy. Um, yes, who would like to react to Dorothy's uh, inter in intervention on the, or another, another subject, maybe? Yes, I want to say something, if I may. I, can, I don't know if you see me, uh, Philip. Yes, yes. Welcome, Philip. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm also a researcher, and uh, I research the pedagog pedagogical strategies of uh, community music projects to see if we can implant them in uh, formal music education. In music schools uh, in Belgium, we have this specific structure that the music schools are separate of the normal or compulsory education. So I'm also a great uh, advocate of group tuition, like Dorothy said. Um, um, one important thing uh, for me, or the most important thing is for me is is, is the social aspect of, of music making, and it's of course obvious in um, in community music projects, but it's less obvious in, in normal uh, in music uh, uh, tuition, and I think it's uh, um, still uh, something that's on the side as a, as a side effect of of, uh, of uh, learning music. For me, it's much more important. I think we can gain a lot by group tuition, uh, especially about the social aspects who, when it's integrated with, with the, the tuition of music. And I'm, I'm, I'm great for, I'm, I'm all for this, this integration. And an interesting, just a small thing, an interesting finding of just the research I finished about these pedagogical strategies with coaches from a community music project is that, uh, well, we, we see some other aspects that we don't really find in a compulsory or music school um, education, so uh, pedagogical strategies, like uh, more um, uh, attention for an, an embodied interaction, uh, more co-coaching, uh, more about the collaboration of, of the group and, and, and the things that, that uh, come out there. And yeah, for me, that are very interesting things to incorporate in formal music education so to get out of the discussion of group tuition and and and, and one to one yeah thank you philip for this very interesting contribution um till are you in the group yes i can see sandrine yes. raising her hand please thank sandrine you. thank you philip uh, what you've uh, just said, uh, it's in, it makes me think about um, what is really important in the in the um, uh, digital culture is the the, the peer to peer um, um, uh, modality of working. And um, um, because I'm here to talk about digitization, because this is this is my my hat uh, to, uh, today. Uh, I think. Um, in the digital world, we have uh, some things about um, uh, about peer to peer collaboration, and I think it's a, it's a, a really interesting uh, uh, pedagogical me method uh, we can uh, um, deal with in our institution and in, in music field. And uh, another thing for me, really important that are not, not part of digital things, but um, I think we maybe we can think about um, what kind of musician we we want to train. And um, um, maybe to, 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 to think about just discipline. We are training a, a violin, we are training a, a pianist, we are training, we are training musician. And I think sometimes it's, it's a, a way to open mind uh, and to think about uh, music and not just uh, um, 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 instrument gesture or things like that. I think we have to, to, to redefine um, our goal about music education, we are training musicians, and uh, maybe it can open mind about uh, 
what and, and not to oppose things because face to face is really interesting. It's a, a pedagogically a, a really interesting, but we can also do a lot of things uh, in um, in group community and in, in all in, in other uh, uh, pedagogical methods. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandrine. Could you explain a little bit um, um, what you mean by peer-to-peer -peer, uh, tuition, please? Um, in fact, in, 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 in informal learning, we, we, uh, we all know that we are learning um, um, every day and every time with others. And uh, um, uh, it's important to, to, to put uh, um, pupils um, um, together because they can learn from each other, um, and um, it's changed. Uh, it's changed the the, the posture of uh, the teacher, and uh, so it, it's really interesting to have that kind of, of uh, pedagogical method. Not not only not to oppose because face to face, I still say it can be really interesting, but we can change uh, and use the, the the force and the interest of a group um, because. Um, we don't understand the things the same way, and um, uh, and uh, the pupils can help each other. So mm -hmm. peer to peer for me is here. We can, uh, we have to learn a lot from each other, and the pupils have to can learn a lot from each other too. That's the force of the group for me. In okay. The teaching, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. So redefine the goals of music education and have more tools than before, especially peer to peer. Uh, yeah, that's very interesting. Thank you, Sami. I can see Till, till please. Um, yep. You will tell me the time I have, we have to stop because uh, I cannot. We have, uh, we have 50 to... seconds left, so maybe we can take just one more very quick statement yeah. or what would you think? Yes, yes, there is one or two reactions. Who would like to say something? So we have we have around thirty seconds left. So if somebody has really a striking, very short idea, <laughs> yes. Um, are you main? Yes, I can see Laura. Uh, okay, hello. Uh, I, I'm I'm from from Italy now. Uh, I have just two very short questions to put on the floor. One is about the. Um, teacher training. Uh, I am a teacher trainer in music education and I think one of the, the main problems about this question is about preparing future teachers to deal with groups because most of them, as most of us, were in the time trained in a one-on-one -on -one, uh, basis. The other question is to remember that the origin of music is community. So if we can re rethink in a way of how music has a, a role inside our everyday life as a community, um, how can I say that, uh, to put together uh, people, to, to, put, uh, to create uh, or to grow up the sense of group, of community. And I think that remember both both the training of teachers and the idea of what, what music is for, we can put together both things and change in a way. We'll make some presentations from the group. We will start. Maybe I, I can start with group one, uh, which was about, uh, so to say, excellence and, uh, uh, and diversity as leading paradigms for high music education contradictions or complements. We started with a, um, uh, with a whiteboard and uh, collected, so to say, uh, keywords. Uh, it was often talk about musical styles, but also about diversity in how we learn social utility of music. Uh, and ethnic uh, backgrounds. And uh, at the end, we discussed the fear to lose excellence. And it was interesting to see that there was, um, on the one hand, uh, there were hints to look at other disciplines like sports, uh, that excellence which must be combined still with taste. And uh, at the end, also the command that institutions uh, have too much power or they are too powerful to uh, somehow uh, to avoid uh, that uh, this change happens very briefly. Uh, 
and the solder? Oh, um, yeah. We had a beginning of mapping on a European map, which strategy work in which context and institution. And uh, we will also send around all the strategies in a PDF afterwards, if you're interested, because very quickly a lot of strategies came up. And we afterwards had a discussion, a strong discussion about the fact that it's not only enough to make music a compulsory subject in primary, but also to provide all the teachers there the means to do it in good quality, because we have a lot of non-specialists in primary school. So to find different strategies or uh, programs or material that help these teachers in order to have good quality compulsory music education. This was the main discussion point. Thank you. Would it be lovely to have more time? <laughs> yeah. OK, maybe I continue with the group three. Um, so it was a very short time for a very big topic, but we had a, uh, we, we already had very rich discussions. Um, the first thing is that it seems not relevant to relevant to oppose face to face and face to face and group tuition. They may be complementary. Uh, the research is very important in, in this sense and uh, shows uh, the quality and access to music e education thanks to group tuitions. And also we have to consider economic problems and uh, make some advocacy for music tuition. Um, because uh, it has been said that one of the most important aspects is the social aspect of music tuition, that we have to keep this in mind. And also it has been said that uh, in a digital world, um, it means a lot to have peer-to-peer -peer collaboration, which is a very interesting way to consider pedagogy. And uh, last but not least, it, it was a, a kind of philosophical um, a remark, but very important. Um, we have to find again the sense of group and community in music education because the origin of music was community. So thank you to all the participants of the group three. Very well, and maybe some closing words or some messages from the president. Maybe you should start, Philip. Just activate my microphone. Thank you, Eric. Yes, in conclusion, very shortly, on behalf of the EMU, I would like, first of all, like to thank again the EMC and all our partners for this webinar, and of course, all the participants as well. Uh, this webinar inspires me some reflections. First, the need for a regular exchange, not only within our respective organization, but also more widely between our different networks, which is highly promoted by the European Agenda for Music. And actually this uh, European Agenda for Music is something we must implement together. Today, we can no longer be satisfied with working only in our own sector. We realize that we are all interdependent and that the, the more we work together, the more things will move forward. So um, this is why this webinar today makes me very optimistic, optimistic, despite the very important difficulties we are facing today. And I thank you all for your participation. Thank you very much. And uh, Thomas? Yes, I will also be very short. I'm, I'm absolutely impressed uh, about the high number of participants today, but it's not only a high number of participants, it's, it's, it's a lot of views, ideas, expertise that came together in only 90 minutes. And we all felt it, I think it was a bit too short, um, but let this be a the first step or not, it's not a first step, but another step in uh, intensify uh, this uh, networking. Uh, for me, uh, the main goal uh, stays to uh, secure the fixed place of music in primary and secondary schools. And that's what I really wanted to say <laughs> as my last words today. And a few words from uh, my side and from the AEC. Uh, I would say, first of all, thank you to all, to all of you for inspiring uh, seminary and for great contribution. And a clear message from the AEC is that we see artistic values and social values that not to be contradictory, but should be paired and combined in fruitful ways. There are lots of work to do here. It's about also collecting updated statistics. And it's about uh, establishing a better dialogue with the European level about how to implement STEAM and the lifelong learning of uh, 
uh, objectives. And then it's about also how we will develop the agenda with the scheme partners. We will do it in cooperation with EMC and hopefully also in cooperation with Culture Action in Europe. And finally, uh, we invite Ian to say a few words on behalf of the EMC. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, thank you, everyone, for participating this morning. It has been inspiring to hear the thinking uh, and to know that education and music education is really at the core, at the center of everything we do. Uh, it's a passion, uh, but it's our way of life, as much as it, for many of us, is our livelihood. Uh, it's something that children, if they have access to it, preferably free access at the point of delivery, will have a life enhancing experience which will last their whole lives they won't all become professional musicians that is ridiculous but like access access to sport they will love music and have uh, an understanding and an empathy for music uh, which will take them into the the cultural citizen the better citizen that our colleague from the european commission spoke about um, I apologize to all of you who are non-English native speakers like me uh, for your understanding. Maybe when we improve our technology back in Bonn, we can put subtitles up in at least, I would suggest five languages, and I'm not going to fight you over which they should be. But I think to be able to express ourselves as clearly as has been the case this morning is inspirational. The European agenda for music is out of date the minute you print it. So it's always open to revision and we will revise the agenda. We will consider the effects of COVID-19, which have been immense for year 2020 and we know for most of 2021. Uh, and I promise you, I can give you an assurance that with our colleagues uh, <coughs> who have participated so strongly this morning, and thanks to AEC, EAS <coughs> and EMU uh, for your great presentations, um, we know that together, I think Till said that the sector, if we, if we are together, is strong. We know that is the case. And my final word, I could say a lot, and those of you who know me know that's something I can do, but I won't this morning uh, because time has gone. All I would say is that online learning is now part of the new normal, but must complement, not replace the live experience and interaction that music brings, not just for our benefit, for, but for the benefit of future generations of our children and their children. And we must never forget that. So my thanks to everyone who has participated and especially to Sarah and Katerina, who have looked after the technical issues around this call, which are not simple. To my own staff in Bonn and to all of you and your respective organizations. We are a big family and big families must stick together. So thank you all.